there's something beautiful about the emotion we call love. We're on a mission to find out more about how it affects every being. It all starts with perception. What if our perception of the world and its many inhabitants expanded? Every being has a different vantage point. When we truly get to know a soul, we find knowledge. Asking questions with an open mind is how we learn how to relate to one another. When we identify with someone beyond the surface level, we fear less and love more. We're all teachers. Every person on this planet has something impactful to share. This podcast is about expanding our vision and illuminating the threads that bind us together as a community. Simply put, this podcast is about lessons in love that we learn along the way in our journeys to find our true selves. Welcome to Unified Threads. gone down in the last day of my most recent trip. I'm here recording. I've got to get up super early in the morning for a bus to the Heathrow airport. But I wanted to record a quick narrative about something I was just reading. A dumbing down of American education. This is an article on Herbalist site. It's talking about the ideas of John Taylor Gatto, author of An Underground History of American Education. One of the things that they're mentioning here is that one of the great designers of the current education system of the United States is Henry Ford. Henry Ford is the founder of Ford Motors. He was looking for the ideal factory workers, and he felt like perhaps there's a way to create that through the education system and also help with the illiteracy rate. I have no doubt that Henry Ford had the best of intentions at heart. But it's time for us to take a look at that, as so many people know, as the education system in the United States has been crumbling. Teachers in the state that I moved most recently from, Oklahoma, have been leaving at a very rapid pace because pay cannot be equal to any extent of many other jobs, and these teachers are putting their whole lives into it. It's something we have to think about. If we can't pay our teachers who educate our next generation, then why are we even having an education system at all? Because if it's just kids going to school and learning from people that are not qualified, why don't they just teach themselves? The grit and the tenacity to show up every single day. Now schools in theory are meant to help you learn that. But if you're learning things you're not interested in, what's the point of showing up? If you're working for a job that you don't care about, why not call in sick when you're not really sick? Take some few days to goof off, do some things that don't really benefit you or anyone around you. Or maybe it does benefit others around you. But why aren't we able to do that in a capacity of our everyday lives? Why is it such an unusual thing to be able to put your passion and your focus in and that makes you... But really, that's what everyone's seeking, right? There's so many people in the world that are unhappy. They wish that they have more purpose or some reason to live. It's late here. I'm going to go to bed. I hope that we can talk some more tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day about this education topic. I've met many beautiful, wise people on this trip, as I have so many different times that I've gone out of my own comfort bubble, which is usually just my room, and get out there. Everyone really is a teacher. From the four-year-old that I'm staying with right now, who took time to point out some beautiful flowers to me, to the 99-year-old 
who I was recently working with and had the honor and privilege of being with her during her final days. In my perspective, it's not about what you know. It's more about, are you open to listening and being there for someone in the moment? And you can't force those moments. It's not possible. You can attempt to force a moment. It's not going to work, though. And you must accept that. And that is number one rule of this universe. Is you cannot force anything. And the more that you try to force something, the further away it's going to get from you. Alright. Onwards to the episode. Thanks for listening to Unified Threats. Namaste. So do you go by stuff? Yeah, that works. All right. And we met through a mutual friend through Facebook. Yep. So Yara thought to connect us because we were talking about getting a mom's perspective on the education system as, as it is now and someone that was also similarly minded in there must be a better way to learn things so kids actually come out prepared for real life. Mm-hmm. Which is something that I think a lot of, at least people I've known have struggled with. They've graduated college and then they get out and then it's kind of like, what now? And applying for jobs can be difficult sometimes. And so as somebody that was homeschooled, I'm always, there's got to be a way to get kids to work sooner. But I know that not everyone agrees with that. So I was just talking to Yara like, what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there's a slippery slope of like child labor laws and what does that mm-hmm. mean? It doesn't have to be so extreme. I know schools that exist where you can be like an intern and you can go, if you have an interest in woodworking or whatever, most likely it's probably not going to be that anymore, then you can find a woodworker and that person will teach you. And and as a child, if you want to do it, I think that's the thing, like people are so extreme. They take forcing children to work in the workforce Mm -hmm. as like the same thing as a child is passionate about something and wants to work in the workforce. Like Mm -hmm. it's different when you're like you know, forcing them because your family is so poor, Mm -hmm. why are you making them learn quadratic equations when they're never going to use that in their passion of what they want to do? And I was very lucky because I was asked to leave my standard public high school. Um, And to clarify the language I use, like, so standard to me is like public high school. Most conventional standard standardized schools like that's what and but private schools are standard too like Mm -hmm. you know especially if you think of anyone who learn uses the prussian style of education from horace mann from like the 18 whatever it was 1850s um i consider that standard like and so not progressive okay yeah the prussians were a group of people who were very much into training their children into their very hierarchical culture. Horace Mann brought this like top-down authoritative style of education to the United States that it would help the citizens learn how to basically be religious and follow direction and believe in God and, you know, fo- uh, follow the authority. Really, our first like e- education philosophy was about getting children to behave. And also, you know, it was a time when children were, you know, it was after they were, after the, you know, when the unions came and they're like, child labor laws, we can't have children working in factories, it's bad for their health. Then they were like just running the street everywhere. Mm-hmm. They're like, because there's no more, like, children existed, a lot, big families because of farming, but when agriculture turned into more of, you know, the industrial revolution, all of a sudden we had children working in factories at farms, not as healthy, not as safe. They got injured. They died young. Then they were like, no more children in the factories, but the parents wanted to work. So we had just children running around all day, every day, like just free. And, t- and you know, and adults were like, no, that's, they're terrorizing everyone. So let's get them into a school. Let's get them to, you know, conform to our society. Let's get them to fear God. And we, all of them should do that. And it should be a standard for every American child that that's what, or United States, whatever child, that that's what they do. Hmm. So, 
but really, seriously, by the 1890s, 1895 or whatever, John Dewey had already started critiquing that style of education. You know, he's like, that might have been good. I mean, I don't know. He didn't say that. I'll say this. <laughs> what I'm saying is that might have been good then if you're trying to figure out just how to survive and you don't want kids running all over the place or whatever to decide that something is still worthwhile from the 1850s now i mean this is before you know industrial revolution but it's also before technology before internet and frankly i just don't think that children need to be sitting in rows memorizing facts and spitting them out on tests like who needs to memorize anything anymore? I even have friends who are physicians who say they Google stuff, like doctors. It's not as important to memorize all the things all the time. Mm -hmm. Do I expect my doctors to memorize how to do a surgery correctly? Fine. You know, you can't mm -hmm. exactly Google. But maybe you can. I don't even know. Maybe they do. I have Watching no idea. Watching a YouTube video the night before. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe to refresh, if you've never, if you haven't operated on like a spleen in 15 years, you might have to have a refresher. I don't know. Yeah. I just think it's but it's definitely not important for all of us to practice memorizing things. I don't have to memorize anything in my life and in my job. And very few things. People's names is hard, but <laughs> that's like it. Yeah. And I'm not I'm getting better at it. I have some tricks. <laughs> Anything that you want to know, you can look up on the internet. Mm -hmm. Well, and we're so inundated with information. That's the other thing is sometimes it's hard to keep facts straight when you're hearing things. Right. You're getting so many impressions through so many different mediums. This is true. Yeah. So nowadays, for me, I have kind of narrowed down what I'm listening to, what I'm reading, because I feel like there are pertinent things I do want to retain, like my routine and my housekeeping job. I need to go in. I need to remember every day where things are going. I need mm -hmm. to, you know... I like to remember things about people's lives that I'm interacting yeah. with, you know, yeah, yeah, so yeah. like asking them, you know, what, how did that turn out, that meeting you had or whatever. I do think that you will memorize things that are of intrinsic value to you. Mm -hmm. Like, I found that it was extremely, when I started my job teaching last year, and I've never been good at memorizing people's names, never <laughs> been like intrinsically important to me, but when I started teaching... I knew all of those children's names by like the end of the day because it became intrinsically important because I knew that they needed me to do that. They had just lost their facilitators. They were in the need of like another facilitator to come in and like know them as people. And so I did. And usually it would have taken me who knows how long to memorize 13 children or 13 people's names, mm -hmm. you yeah. know? Yeah. So. Okay. So let's back up. So you just started yeah. teaching a year ago is what you said? In the course of my studies, I have substitute taught in public schools. And then last year, I worked for a private school in the area called Clon Lara. Okay. Um, I actually graduated from that school in 2002. That's in Ann Arbor, right? Yeah. Okay. And it was a very different school than when I graduated than it is now. But the thing is, it's very hard in Michigan to have a school like the ones that I advocate for and like the ones that exist in other parts of the country. Michigan is literally the worst state for progressive education it's not regulated but it's frowned upon to have education centers without a curriculum the state of michigan follows common core through anything um technically you're not even supposed to have a homeschool collective here that operates during the day it could only operate after school hours because homeschooling happens at home i thought that well, Little Lake Learning Community, which is, by the way, how the, we both know this yep. other friend, her kids go to Little Lake. Mm -hmm. I think your kids go mm -hmm. to Little Lake. Yeah. Isn't that a homeschool collective or is that something? Yep. And they, okay. and it's, and thankfully they, like I said, it's not a regulated thing, but it's difficult to start one because eventually you'll get to the point where someone will say that's technically not supposed to exist. And parents get scared. And it's hard to, like, get parents understanding that, I think. It's also hard here because Ann Arbor, especially, well, Ann Arbor, it seems like they have choice there. Yeah, like, there seems to be a wide variety of different types of schools. Seems to yeah. be that. But when you actually go through and visit the schools or talk to the people, which I've done, they're all basically the same thing. 
They, uh, you know, they, they still expect children to learn to read by this age. They still expect things to happen by this time. And the better ones, the more progressive is what I would call ones, which aren't completely true, but the more progressive ones, there's a lottery and a wait list to get in. I will say that Little Lake is the closest thing to the best place to send your child. Unfortunately, in Michigan, like, they don't get any funding, you know, from the state. It's all tuition-based, which one thing that we talk about in this industry is schools that don't make it to 10 years will probably die. Like, most of the schools, most most progressive schools that are tuition-based only, which Little Lake is, don't make it before 10 years. If they do, then that means that community is willing to support them and they'll live. Mm-hmm. Right now, in Michigan, the only other school that was progressive closed a couple years ago. They're turning it into an after-school program instead. So Little Lake is, I think, seven years? Is that right? They're going into their eighth. Okay. In a place like Ann Arbor especially, it's going to be a lot harder to get people to pay money for a school when they can just send them to Ann Arbor's good enough schools. My research for my master's is going to focus around people who have graduated from all the high schools in Ann Arbor. And I've, I've actually talked to the superintendent of Ann Arbor Public Schools about this um, a couple of times, once in person and once in an email, where it's confusing to me that um, Community High School and Ann Arbor Open, which are the most progressive schools that I was getting they have a waiting list so in the lottery system so why is it that the two most popular schools to get into are only two one for each program and you have three plus others that are people don't want to get into don't there's no lottery for Huron Pioneer and Skyline why is that why do you have three schools that people prefer not to go to and one school that has why don't you have two that are like community that are more progressive Mm -hmm. and then two that are more standard and people can choose betsy devos is all about choice but like why don't we have that we don't have that in michigan she's about like fake choice yeah that's one of the things i wanted to bring up is now that we've entered into the realm of betsy devos so she's steering the helm for the entire country's department of education now and she's from michigan so when i saw that And I heard about how, in a lot of ways, the homeschooling laws are, you know, if you wanted to homeschool your kids, it's completely unregulated here, I think, right? Yes. Yes. Yes, basically it is, yeah. For me, as a homeschooler who always lived in states where it was pretty much unregulated and it allowed my mom a lot of flexibility, I kind of thought, hmm, interesting. I wonder what's going to happen here. People say Betsy DeVos was hired to fly the plane into the building proverbially with the education system you know I don't necessarily see that traditional schools work that well but you're right if it's a fake choice thing if we don't actually have the infrastructure available for parents that want to homeschool their kids so I posted something about this and I was so mad because nobody nobody wants to talk about education except for me like I will post things on my Facebook and get like this blow up of like discussion and then I'll post something about education it's just like crickets I guess I just posted this I'm like cause it was like talking about Betsy DeVos talking about school of choice t- and you know that's what I think I, I agree with taking I do not think that educating our children should be a federal thing I don't think it should be federally regulated. I don't think it should be like a federally mandated thing. I don't think it should be standardized. I don't think any of that stuff. Betsy DeBoss technically agrees with me. Yeah. But I think where we differ is that she thinks that any corporation can open a charter school and make money off of it, from my understanding of what I've been reading about her uh, philosophies. That being said, though, I guess it depends on how we want to define education, right? I think I think Betsy DeVos still defines education as being something that is done to children. Lighting of a fire, not filling of a pail, you know? So, like, if, if we think about it as children are empty vessels to be filled, then we're not really getting to the crux of the problem, which is education should not be that. Education is not that. 
we are all biologically geared to learn stuff. That's like the whole purpose of human beings. Mm -hmm. Like we are born in the world as scientists who want to learn things, who want to figure stuff out. Like we're literally born doing that. There's an organization called the Alliance for Self-Directed Learning. And have you heard of them? No, I haven't. It was started by Dr. Peter Gray. Um, he is a neuroscientist who's been studying the way we learn for a while now. I can't remember the year, but and he's he's a co I think a co-founder of um, like I said the Alliance of Self-Directed Education. Their website is self-directed.org. Okay, it's incredible, and their definition of education is this. Education is the sum of everything a person learns that enables that person to live a satisfying and meaningful life. So, if that is going to be our definition of education, which I hope it is in the future for our culture, then that needs to be determined by the community in which the children are being educated in. Because the things that are important to my community might not be as important to a community in Atlanta, Georgia. I do think that grassroots level education is important. I think that the adults in the community need to weigh in on that. And I think the children in the community need to weigh in on that. Like mm -hmm. what's important for them. Dr. Peter Gray has six things that he believes and what his research, research has proven will enable the children to be self-directed and to learn in a self-directed way. Because right, because you, because uh, especially when I started this work, like 15 years ago, I, my, you know, my mom's worked in the public school system for a while and she's like, yeah, but I've met children who just don't learn, who won't read. And I'm like, well, I guarantee that their needs haven't been met and they are not reading because they're angry. I mean, children will learn what's in their culture. If they look around them and it's important, they will learn it. All humans mm -hmm. do. That's just part of how we've learned to like be adaptable as human beings. It's just, we're all born with that innate thing. But the six things, one is to truly understand that the learning is up to them. I think in public school a lot, and don't get me wrong, I love public school teachers. I think they're amazing. I think that they're superhuman. I could never, ever do that job. But I think a lot of the time the environment in which they work is very much, you are the teacher. You do the teaching. You give them stuff to learn and they learn it and then you test them on that stuff and if they didn't learn it then you're a bad teacher. The number one thing is students need to understand that like this their world and their life and their learning and their information and whatever they think is important is important and that mm -hmm. should be nurtured by adults who are helpers not judgers which is another one on the list. I think a lot of time with teaching you have to be a judge because you're grading. Just the act of grading is judgment. You know, mm -hmm. and it's pitting children against each other. And it's forcing this competition that really only happens in our standardized schools. I don't really feel a time where I'm, like, in competition with other humans. Like, except for then. Another one that's more controversial, I think, to some people is unlimited opportunities to play. Because in people's research of primates and hunter-gatherers and even like us humans, how we learn is by playing. Carnivores learn how to chase after prey by chasing after each other. In hunter-gatherer cultures, the children learn how to hunt by, by making their own child versions of spears. And similarly, children learn how to be in our culture by playing all the time. Mm -hmm. Playing is like, you know, when you ever interrupt a child playing, wow, it's not a good idea because they will freak because it's like my partner's a scientist it'd be like if i went into his laboratory he's in the middle of spiking samples all right lev come on time to go he'd be furious because he's working on this sensitive project that's how we all are we're all scientists we're born that way letting the children play is letting them learn is letting them learn themselves how the world works and you know doing experiments why do you think like toddlers will like throw their stuff off the top of the thing they want to see it fall they want to see what happens they're like really about cause and effect just like we all are okay so we were talking about that school model Sudbury Valley schools and facilitators and how they are not even allowed to suggest activities for the children to do that is against their model trying to be the opposite of um you know standard conventional schools 
So adults aren't even allowed to offer things to do at that school. Like, it's completely student-run. Wow. That worked for Framingham, Massachusetts in the 60s and continues to work for that school today. And there are a few others that have popped up around, around the country and, and I believe the world. And it works. I just don't think it works for every community. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if, if you're a community like Framingham, Massachusetts, which is very wealthy, um, you know, predominantly privileged in many ways, uh, I think that it's easier to put that onus on the children. I think if you, I think when you take that model to a different place, a place where maybe children don't have supportive parents, where their parents have to work multiple jobs, where there's not as much privilege, I feel like you're gonna have to work out a whole lot of different things before you can start expecting the children to teach themselves. Mm -hmm. I do think all healthy children can teach themselves, but I think that healthy means a lot of there's a lot of steps to get there to be healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can't be anxious about where you're going to sleep at night and also teach yourself things and learn yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, no one can, not even adults. Yeah, it's a hierarchy of needs, going right. back to that. Yeah. It's really important. You can't learn intellectually until, you know, you have shelter, you have food, you have water, and then you yeah. can start to think about intellectual and then spiritual, too. And oh, yeah, and I would think them. you can't learn unless you feel related to in some way. Mm -hmm. I would say you can't learn unless you feel a part of a community. Mm -hmm. Like, you feel that it's important to learn those things. If you don't feel like it's important to learn things, if you don't have any, um, like, intrinsic motivation, you know, then you're not going to easily learn the things. Mm -hmm. well, what does community mean to you when you're speaking of community? Being in a group of people that hold themselves accountable and also you accountable for the harmony of the whole. Okay, and so then when there's not harmony in the whole and somebody's wanting to hold someone else accountable but that person doesn't want to be held accountable, then what? Then everybody holds that person accountable and either they change or they decide that community is not for them. That's one of the more difficult things about community that I talked to the last episode interviewee about was right now we have the flexibility to be able to cho choose our community. We can be somewhat fluid in the way that we find our friends. We can be connected through friends of friends. We don't have to just stick with the 300 people in our walking radius. Now, if that were to change, and we could no longer choose our community, and that's how education was also done. They're our kids... They are the ones that are deciding what's being learned. There's one child that doesn't want to learn that, that finds it ridiculous, that starts to convince other children also ridiculous. You know, those are the scenarios where it might take a little bit of somebody that has a little bit more experience, like an advisory role or something to mediate somehow with the kids. And I feel like we could really put a lot more of the power in the kids' hands. I think we take a lot of that away yeah. from them. <laughs> and that's what Agile Learning Centers really do quite okay. well. And Little Lake also does that. Yeah, I, I've learned well. that from them. Um, and that's one thing that I do think that the Agile Learning Centers does, I hate to say better because I hate to pit them against each other, but does in a way that makes more sense to me um, because the facilitators very much bring their whole selves to the table. You know, the facilitators very... And they don't, like, teach classes necessarily unless the students ask for them you know they're not going to hide the fact that they can play a mean guitar or do programming because that's what they do like everyone comes every morning everyone facilitators and students make a list of intentions for that day and I think that's really important because I think that it's important to practice mindfulness especially in this kind of technological age where we have so much we were talking about our calendars earlier where we have so much going on yeah. it's really important for us to like have a way to see all the things we have to do to be mindful of things we're doing and to question why we're not doing stuff you mm -hmm. know like if I've had for example right now on my to-do list I've had start working on your master's be enrolled for my next courses and that's been sitting on my to-do list forever and I'm starting to wonder like why like why haven't you been intentional about doing that thing you know mm -hmm. and it starts me asking questions about my purpose and like why I'm doing things and I think that's really important to learn how to do I mean really as soon as possible I wish I would have had more organization um, they use something called a Kanban board um, which is a uh, Japanese invention 
and it really helps people to be like like I said, intentional. So like you, you have sticky notes and you put everything that you want on, that you ever want to do forever. And then every day you move some stuff over. And if you accomplish it, you put it into the accomplished thing and that's, and you save that. If you don't accomplish it, you put it back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's nice because at the end of the year, the students have a whole list of things they accomplished and a whole list of things that they never got around to. And it's, it's nice to be able to see those two things. Like, and then with the things you've accomplished, you can say like, wow, like, I'm really in obviously interested in like marine biology. I did all this stuff focusing on like oceans and going to visit dolphins. I mean, I'm being like super simple, but, that, but it's kind of, it's an interesting way to do it. And I really respect that a lot. And I like the fact that the facilitators are also the learners. Like they don't call themselves teachers. They're facilitators. I mean, at little like yeah. they do the same thing. Facilitators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're facilitating in the learning and you're also learning yourself theoretically. And that's mm -hmm. like the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've talked to Alex at Little Lake a little bit about this and he's told me how he learns so much from the kids. Mm -hmm. And I learn every time I'm around a group of kids. You know, I, just, I see their imaginations and I can, you know, see more of the world from their eyes when I spend a little bit of time with the kid. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, they're teachers too. Everyone is. And that's yeah. the thing. We're all learners and teachers all the time. Yeah. Like at the same time, you know. And yeah, so, yeah. and I think that standard uh, conventional school takes that power away from children mm -hmm. and it makes them the passive recipient of information rather than you know an excited scholar of the world anything you'd like to add additionally as we hit stop on the recorder if you want to support the little lake learning <laughs> little lake learning community so that my son and other children in the in the community have access to progressive education um you can go on their website at littlelakeschool.org and give them money littlelakeschool.org watch out for a crowdfunding campaign coming soon to help them raise money for a new stable for their class dragon <laughs> yes <laughs> alright signing off thank you for being a part of Unified Threads namaste namaste to you. and thank you to Yaro for introducing us yay yay Yaro alright here we go community stop well don't stop actually just keep going I suggest that uh, we could somehow uh, improve our educational system uh, if we could be free to think and if we could allow allow uh, if our methods of learning allow the kids to, to think alone without forcing them to learn not to reproduce uh, reproduce ourselves and to generate ourselves but to to uh, recreate a new scientist and new thinkers who would find something uh, better as we, we did. Uh, our societies, were, our educational system were, were just copying, uh, creating copy from another, uh, one another. Like for example, our, uh, the, the educational system is here and tried to, to make, for me, a copy from someone else and I've become a doctor. And what I did is just, I took the steps of someone else. I didn't think out of the, the box. I just uh, learned a few books and I couldn't think out of these books. I, mean, I couldn't experience anything al alone. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do any search or research. Or, uh, so I just uh, copied the same steps. And at the end I, I become a doctor. And what happened is some a doctor from an older generation will die soon and I will be a doctor and take his place. So what happened is I'm just a copy from someone else. I'm not being, uh, uh, I'm not renewing the word. I'm not trying to do anything new. And that's not my fault. That's the fault of someone who, who created this educational system. They don't want me to think out of the box. They want me just to copy them and to take uh, exactly those steps to be a successful, what we call success, successful man, successful woman. You are successful, so, uh, for example, but what does it mean to be a successful? For each one has another 
definition to to success. Some people think that successful is money, and the more, the more you have it, the more you're successful. Other things it's about respect and uh, given other definitions for it. Mm-hmm. What we now want is closer contact and better understanding between individuals and communities all over the earth and the elimination of egoism and pride, which is always prone to plunge the world into primeval barbarism and strife. Peace can only come as a natural consequence of universal enlightenment. That was spoken by Nikola Tesla, a Serbian-American inventor, engineer, and physicist, best known for his contributions to designing modern alternating current electric supply. He passed away on the 7th of January, 1943. Educate is derived from the Latin verb educare. According to wordsense.eu, educare could mean to bring up, to train, to teach. Educate, on the other hand, according to Merriam Webster dictionary, means three different meanings. Number one, and there's two parts of this A, to provide schooling for or B, to train by formal instruction and supervised practice, especially in a skill, trade, or profession. The second meaning of educate is to develop mentally, morally, or aesthetically, especially by instruction. The second part of the second description is to provide with information. And then the third meaning of educate, according to Merriam-Webster, is to persuade or condition to feel, believe, or act in a desired way. An example here is educate the public to support our position. This is in contrast to a quote from Jeff Salloway. He is one of the founders of the Hayground School, a different type of school model in Long Island. It says, this is at once the most exhilarating and sobering work with which I have ever become involved. In collaborating with the founders and future members of Hayground School, I am grabbing a rare opportunity. I am, in fact, preparing to re-educate myself to go back to school. Not the school to which I was sent off at five years of age, but a far brighter, more illuminating place. This time with my children at my side, with friends and neighbors all around me, I will be learning things that no one cared to teach me last time around. Things like respect, not for facts, but for people and what they can teach you. Respect for oneself, one's emotional, physical, spiritual, and historic self. Respect for one's capacity for learning and invention and creativity. Respect for all of the members of one's community, not just the ones who look and sound like me. Together, we will be learning how to teach and be taught, how to help and be helped, how to ask questions and find answers. You see, I am doing this for myself, to become a better person. This way, if my kids take after me, or I take after them, well, we've got it covered either way. Again, that was a quote from Jeff Salloway, who passed away in 2001, in the process of founding the Hayground School. And one of the other thoughts I wanted to put out there is from Seth Godin, the marketing expert. He believes that voluntary education is different from compulsory education. Compulsory education is what we've all grown up with and what many students are still dealing with here in 2017. In the words of Seth Godin, change brings risk and risk brings fear. Those new horizons, those new opportunities, those new skills, they might not be as comfortable as what you've got going on right now. And so the challenge. We choose not to learn because it's either going to fail, embarrassing and expensive, or it's going to work, frightening. We get ourselves stuck between a rock and a hard place of inaction. The door is open to be heroic, to go on the journey from a place of fear, not to wait for the fear to go away before you've begun, 
but instead to begin precisely because there is fear. Those that have successfully come before us have figured out how to make this leap, to feel and embrace these fears, not to deny them, and to dig in because and despite. Just some thoughts to ponder as we continue to dig into what does it mean to learn? What does it mean to grow? I'd like to give a big thank you to Steph for sharing her perspectives on the podcast today. And then, of course, Omar. Uh, Omar and I met a couple of years ago in Greece. He's now living in Germany. Uh, He is a refugee from Syria. And I'm so glad we were able to reconnect during my trip there a couple of months ago. And it's great to hear his perspective and be able to feature that in this episode. And then, of course... Thank you to all of those at the Collab Lab, Anna and Taylor with Honey Monsoon, the Harmony Collective who provided some of the music for today, specifically the Hare Krishna mantra you're hearing in the background, and Corey Coates of Podfly Productions for rocking it out on the producer role for this episode. So what about you guys? I'd love to hear from you. If you have some suggestions on future episodes, or if you'd like to send your feedback about how this episode made you feel, or what it maybe rose up in you that you hadn't thought about before, please go to unifiedthreads.com and chat with me. There's a live chat box on the website. I'll be answering that. Uh, We're also happy to be playing this on YouTube. So if you're hearing it on YouTube, just jump over to unifiedthreads.com. Or if you comment on YouTube, I'm going to hopefully answer uh, comments there as well. Thank you again for listening. We're going to leave you some tunes. And, uh, oh, of course, can't forget AJ Ben who was one of the musicians featured today on the Collab Labs track that Anna and Taylor from Honey Monsoon sent over. He is the saxophone player you're going to hear rocking it out. All right, until next time, namaste, and keep holding doors for people, and smiling, of course, too. Much love. Much love.